starting this morning. And this, the name of the title is Nothing Profound, but it, the name of the title of the series is called Knowing God. So our desire, we're going to go right through the summer with this. We're all going to be standalone messages. But, you know, our desire is to seek Him and to know Him. And um, as we go through the summer, we pray that God would just do a powerful work in each individual. We're thinking that, you know, this is not any small matter, though, to know God, is it? It's like crazy gazing upon a great mountain range. You know, I was thinking about a time when uh, I had the opportunity to uh, lead worship up in uh, Loon Mountain. And on top of Loon Mountain, they have a church. And uh, the seats are all nestled into the mountain itself. But the platform which we did worship kind of extended out. And, and I got to tell you, when you're singing, How Great Thou Art Up There, and you look upon this mountain, it gives you a whole other perspective of God. It was beautiful. But we realize, even with our eyes, there's only certain things we can see. What our eyes can focus upon. You might focus upon this beautiful ridge. What your eyes are focusing upon, and we know that God is so much more. You know, you talk to someone who tried to climb Mount Everest, and they would tell you until you get to the base, to see the size of this mountain, you never really know how big the ascent, how the elevation, the slopes, the ridges. How would you ever know unless you got up close? How much more can we say about God? That when we look at one aspect of Him, let's just say His love, but as we approach Him and we get closer and closer to Him, we see the height the depth, the width, the breadth of His love. It's inconceivable to know, think that we even know this love at all. God is much more than that. He's massive. His love is infinite. His love is without borders or boundaries. It's not, it's not even constrained by time or space. And you can take every characteristic or attribute about God and get close to Him. Imagine His holiness. Imagine the size of that mountain that we get to gaze upon as we try to know God. But as we get there, as we walk together, as we journey together this summer, we'll see how this expands like a panoramic view. Wow, that was a big one. His majesty. <laughs> This journey of knowing Him. What we want to pray, this is what we're praying for you. And we're praying for me. And this is what we're praying for this church. Mm -hmm. That we would never be satisfied at looking at the closest hill. We want to see the mountain. Mm -hmm. And that's our prayer. So as pilgrims, we're looking to do some exploring this summer. To know God. And um, this morning, we are going to start the series as an overview with a uh, sermon we call the Gospel, the Great Trail of Salvation. And, and the reason why we wanted to start there in this overview, because we're going to be talking about every one of these individual things that I'm going to talk about today, we're going to talk about in more detail. But when you think about this, when, when people have questions of faith, there's just times in our life we, we try to simple, remember that I talked about that cliff note answer, the, the short answer, and as we've been studying the Behold Your God, we know it's much more complex than this. But sometimes we just want to ask someone a question. Have you been saved? And we use this word saved. But for the non-church, for the non-believer, what does that even mean? What are you saved from? What does it really mean? And we want to unpack that. See, that word implies so much more. It implies so much more of the gospel story. That we want to we want to blaze this trail today. We want to blaze it in such a way that you would know this trail, that you would study this trail. So when people come into your life that need the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a trail you can take them down, and you can explain it in such a way that have meaning, would have power, and the Holy Spirit would just ignite this. This is the trail we're going today. 
it's not going to just be about, hey, are you saved? But it's going to be the full gospel. So today, I'd like you to stand with me. We're going to read together. We haven't done that for a while, so that would be great. If we could read together. We're going to go to the Gospel of John. If you want to open up your Bibles, chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 16 to 21. The Sky Bible will have the verses on there as well. So if you'd read with me this morning, and let God's Word saturate your heart today. Amen. Starting in verse 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is John 3.16. You've got God, you've got us, the world, you've got Christ, you've got our response. I was thinking about growing up, you don't see this so much anymore, but you, it would be very common to watch a baseball game, a football game, a basketball game, where there'd be someone out there in the crowd holding up a John 3.16 sign. Now, I don't know if they're there anymore, but the cameras don't definitely pan there anymore. But they used to always be there. Wherever you went, the things that you loved, you would see God, for God so loved the world. And it was just this presence of God, but now you just don't see this anymore. This is the gospel in a nutshell. But yet we know the trail is much larger than this. I want you to know that if we had to give the gospel in just those short answers or cliff notes, to really get the whole picture of this gospel for someone who doesn't know the Lord it may be difficult. You know, we don't really know what true love looks like. How do we know that God would really love us this way? Unconditional, undeniable. We wouldn't know these things. So we want to explore today this gospel. And I give you an example of this because, see, the gospel does not exist apart from the God. The cross does not exist outside of creation. The New Testament does not exist without the old. And the old does not exist without the new. This trail spans from creation to full restoration. This is the journey that we're on. And there's many markers. There's many signs along the way for us. There's many signs for all humanity that will help us. And there's words that direct our path. <coughs> In John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God gave the way to this gospel for God. For God. This appears twice in this text, verse 16 and 17. But here you really see the heart of God. His love, his infinite love, his majestic love. And his he glories in this. And you see, from the very time of creation, in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female. His intent was image bearers of God. To bear an image 
an image that we'd say, boy, in me it's probably pretty dim. But yet he, he created image bearers that would bear this image throughout the world. And we know that uh, rebellion took place in the garden. But here's the caution when you read a verse like John 3.16. We take this verse and we take it out of the Bible and we sit it on some sort of a throne and we really need to see it, how it sits throughout the text. And in John, if you look at John chapter 1, this is beautiful. Of what you see, because what he is expressing here comes. Look at John chapter 1, verse 1 in the beginning was the Word. Going all the way back to the creation, to the beginning of time. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, speaking of Jesus Christ. At creation, all things were made through him, speaking of Jesus Christ. And without him, there was nothing, not anything was made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light that shines in the darkness. And the darkness could not overcome it. This is a beautiful picture, isn't it? That Jesus Christ there at the beginning. The image, God's spirit hovering. But the image of man, this God-man. We were to bear the image. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says this. Just as we were born in the image of the dust of man, meaning Adam, we, ought, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, Jesus Christ. And if you go farther, in John, verse 9 says this. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, and he was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people, and they did not receive him. But to tell all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's amazing. You see in the text, you can continue on John, and you see how later in chapter 1, he has this interaction with John, and not only does he say in this text that Jesus Christ is God, but you see John acknowledge he is not just God, but he's God's offering. He's the Lamb of God. We see later in then you see Jesus' power in chapter 2 where he goes to Cana, the wedding at Cana. He turns water to wine. You see Jesus' power. We see Jesus' authority. He cleansed in the temple at Passover. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Then we have Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus. This is quite the interaction. The Pharisee of Pharisees, the main teacher of Israel. And what is he doing here? In, in chapter 3, verse 16, he is reiterating what he has said through these beginning uh, verses in chapter 1, chapter 2, to chapter 3. He says this in verse 2. We know this is what Nicodemus said of Christ. He says, we know that you are a teacher that come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do. God's power. In John 3, 3, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know what I love? I love Nicodemus' response. He says, how could this be? How could this be? I taught. I studied. How could this be? He says, no, this is a work of God, not a work of you. You had nothing to do with your birth. Nor do you have to be born again. And he goes, he says later on, he says, it's like the wind. The wind goes where it wants. You have no control over the wind. Nor do you have by the Spirit of God. You have no control. <coughs> this is amazing. This is image bearers. 
of God. So you see that what they're saying in this gospel here, when he talks about the light of men, he is reiterating God himself. We get so confused. Everybody gets confused even on John 3.16 because we take it out when Jesus loves everybody. He does. Then why in the text did he say he condemns them? You would have to tell me this. Because remember, God is who he is. His love is infinite. He's unchangeable. His love hasn't changed. Why is it some like the darkness more than the light? Is this for everyone? Is it not? But we see that there was rebellion that took place in the garden. And there's a great amount of grace that you see throughout all of Scripture of God. And you see that humanity wasn't lost. God could have destroyed Adam and Eve, but he didn't. In fact, all he did, they cast him out of the cast them out of Eden because of their sin. <coughs> Literally, rebellion against God. Eating that apple that God told them not to touch of that tree of knowledge. And what was lost? It wasn't human life. Because Adam and Eve lived. It was the ability for us as a people to bear the image of the Holy God. And it was lost from that time forward. David writes it this way in Psalm 51 5. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What was he saying to us? Before he took his first breath of fresh air, he was already in sin. He realized this. In the New Testament, right, the Apostle Paul in Romans 3.23 says, We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, when we're on this journey, we don't realize we're all, it's even footing, isn't it? When you start off, when you're at the foot of the mountain, the, the terrain is not that bad. We're all kind of walking together. There is, there's a, we're all walking in this sin together. And, and for, so the first mockery you might see on this trip, you're saying rebellion and sin. And, and we might see this sign and we, we look at it and say, okay, what do we do with this? Do we continue the journey? Many people stop right here. Many people will stop right here. You know, they, they feel that, uh, that they have a right to the decisions they make. They have a right to live the way that they want to live. And that's called the root sin of pride, isn't it? But many people stop right there. See, we have a natural rebellion to holiness. Scripture teaches us that. So as we decide to move forward and we see that sign and we say, you know what, let's stay on the track. Let's stay the course. Let's not give up so soon. We come to this next marker and it says it's the law. Oh boy, here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 5. But again, we're searching for God. That's who we're searching for. And if we know God, we know that He is the standard of every attribute that He is. His holiness, His righteousness, His love. God is the standard. Nobody else. So on this track, He gives Israel this law. And why does He do this? He says, listen, this is my standard. And we realize that we cannot follow that. So why? Why should we? Why should we go any farther? We know that we can't do it. Have you ever tried something in your life and someone encouraged you to do something and you felt like you weren't equipped to do? Well, in our faith journey, we're not equipped without Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of that law. And this points towards this great chasm between us and God. And this road isn't easy for anyone, is it? This journey's long. This mountain's tall. It's big. It's massive. These markers are important. Because you might know people in your life that they've followed a whole bunch of rules. And their religious experience has been rules. But there were so many rules that they couldn't do it and they gave up. They gave up on searching for this God. They stopped right here. They stopped at this marker. 
Man, they haven't got up the path. And they saw this and they said, listen, if I've got to go this way, it's not going to happen. Then you might see another marker that might be a little bit more encouraging to you. And it's that God created a nation. We're going to need all the help we can get to get to the top of this mountain, right? Through Abraham. God created this. He created a nation. Joseph fed a nation. God's grace throughout Scripture. People to come to himself. You might see another sign along the path. God raised up kings and prophets to speak on his behalf. God has always been the one at the beginning who initiates, he creates, and he restores. Look at what happened when Ezekiel was asked to prophesy to Israel in chapter 36. It's a powerful message. This is what he says. This is God speaking to Israel. He says, therefore, Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, God being the standard, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. This is what he says. And in your Bible, you should highlight this. Every time you see, I will. This is God speaking now. He says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land, the promised land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleansings and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Watch what path you're on. Watch what journey you're on. You shall dwell in the land that I give your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all uncleansedness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant, that there be no famine upon you, and I will make fruit of the tree. I will. Twelve times. God is commanding what He is going to do, what He is going to initiate. And as you think of this gospel message, 1 John 1, 9, Jesus Christ is faithful and just to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. He will, not us. You don't have to be a great hiker. You don't have to be in great shape. You need to walk. You need to obey the signs and, and, and wonders of God. It's in fact what he's telling us that. And he'd give you a new spirit. This is what he was telling Nicodemus. That he would cleanse them. He would give them a new spirit. The Holy Spirit. This is a work of God in our lives. This is the gospel. This is what God is going to do to a nation. To a people who follow him. This is just not, hey, raise your hand or repeat a prayer after me. No, God says it's me. I will. I will clean you. I will restore you. I will give you a new heart. I will give you desires that you're going to want to make this walk. And you're going to want to share my gospel. And you're going to want to desire me. I will. He said he'll make you a great nation. Sort of like seeing this is a fun When you see the narrative of the Bible, you've got this big wide end. You've got priests, kings, and prophets that's narrowing closer and closer to Christ as we go through this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He loved this world. 
Sometimes when we read scripture, it gets a little confusing because in John's first epistle, chapter 2, he told us to hate the world. So what is he saying? How are you to interact with this world? When I say this, in John's first epistle, he's telling you about the way of the world, the systems of the world. Don't conform to these systems. What he's talking about here is a people, a distinct people, the people of God. These are the people, his sheep of his pasture. The people that he's chosen since the foundation of the world. Both Jew and Gentile. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue that Christ himself would gather his people. His sheep. John 6, 37 says this, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. What a word, what a good word of assurance. John 10, 14 through 16 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. There's something about the voice of God. It's His voice. The same voice who created the universe. Called you by name. And when He calls you by name, there is something that happens by the power of the Spirit of God that opens up our hearts to the reality of God Himself. There's many signs that you can see on this trail you know. This one might see is adoption this way. I want to be part of that family, amen? amen. You see, you see that by birthright, I'm not in, but only by God's grace that I could be adopted into his family. God initiated this gospel. He loved this people, and he gave his only son for it. See, here's the thing. You can't have the gospel without God. So often we try to eliminate this. We, we want something, but we don't necessarily want God. We talk about holiness. How many times do you hear about holiness in the church anymore? You don't. Think of the implication of this. He said, if you're not holy, you're not entering the kingdom of God. And here's the implication for us. Children that are on this trail walking without holiness, how do we get holy? Through Jesus Christ. So if there's no need of holiness, why do we need Jesus? See the implication here? You can't have the gospel without God. You need Him. He is the initiator of the gospel. So many signs along this journey and this path. But you might be asking questions that you know that there's, there's danger ahead. There's this chasm ahead. How do you deal with this chasm? How do you, are you thinking about it as you're walking? How am I going to cross this thing? How am I going to get across? Is there going to be a bridge? What is there going to be? Am I going to swing from a vine? What am I going to do? But it exists. This chasm exists between us and God. John 3.17 says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. This chasm between God and man would be crossed by Christ. Amen. That He would go to Calvary. And on Calvary's hill, He paid the ultimate price. He would appease a God. But yet, He lived. He conquered that. This chasm comes through Christ. See how the final is going more and more. This gospel leads to Christ. It leads to the cross. This divine flesh, the divine came into flesh. Holy Spirit came upon a young virgin in a manger, in a lonely manger. The God-man was born. And it says, in the same way that Adam imputed sin to us, gave us this sin, he gave us this chasm. He said the second Adam, Jesus Christ, 
would give us his righteousness. The way. This is the gospel. He was the Lamb of God. <coughs> the unblemished Lord, whose blood would satisfy a holy, just God. Who could endure this cross? Who could endure? Do you know anybody who could endure the full wrath of God? But God himself. So you might see a sign. You might be looking for other signs. Is there an easier way? It looks like the terrain is getting rough. Is there an easier path for me? Is there an easier path for you? John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Guess what? There's no other way. You've got to decide. Are you going to stop? Or are you going to keep going on this trail? And you might see a sign now that says atonement. Oh, there's something else here. Wait a minute, what is this? This atonement, we need to know these words that are in the Bible. It's God's activity of reconciling us and restoring us to himself. Removing the guilt, removing the chasm from you. Jesus, substitutionary death on the cross. This is atonement. This is the way that we're to walk. We're to walk in the path of Christ. You might see another sign and say, okay, I'm coming. And, and so the atonement sign is near us. And you see another sign. And it says, justify. Justification. And this is a legal action of God that declares the believer free from the guilt. John 13, 19 through 20 says this, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Jesus, the light of the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because the works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be made exposed. Holy things from God. Can I tell you when you're on this trail and you start to get encouraged because you didn't think that you could make it this far anyways? Can I just say something to you? That when we get the courage <coughs> to take our stuff and bring it to the light, God just does something with this. He removes the guilt and the shame. The people that carry this guilt and the shame, they're afraid. They're chicken, and they can't go any farther. So they hold these things back from God, like God can't see it. But God is God. He's all-knowing. He already knows it. But he looks at us and he says, can't you walk? Can't you walk? Can't you bring it to me? And when he does, these are the people of the light. They bring everything to the light. You see this sign that says, you're justified. Praise the Lord. You might see another sign that says propitiation. You say, oh boy, what is that? It means this. God's wrath has been appeased. Done. Done. You mean, what does that mean as you're walking? As you're walking with your family. As you're walking with your friends. As you're walking as a couple. What does this mean? It means that chasm... It's gone. There is going to be no chasm for you to travel. God's wrath has been appeased. And then you might see another sign that says, Regeneration. Oh boy, a bottle of water for us. We're going to refresh our souls. This is the work of God's Spirit in you, which He changes your spiritual condition. He changes. This is the work of God. See, you can't have this without God. You can't have this without the Holy Spirit. He changes your spiritual condition. You're ready to go the distance. You're ready to walk this walk. You're ready to live this gospel. This is the beginning of the new you. Makeover time. The new creation. The new birth. Born again, have you told them. This is the new Genesis, by the way. The new beginning. 
John 3.21 says, But whoever does what is true and comes to the light, and you bring everything to the light, you let it all go. You know, when my son preached here a while ago, um, he shared uh, something with you all that was really um, brave. You know, when you think you're raising your children a certain way, and everything looks holy on the outside, but when I realized there wasn't so much on the inside for him, and he shared that with you, until the day that he picked up the phone and called me, and he told me, and he brought it into the light. My love for him could not have grown more. Amen. And through that work, when we bring things to the light, this is a work of God. So you might see a little sign, the backpack that you're carrying might be a little bit heavy. You'll see a sign that'll say, let me load repentance here. <laughs> Repent and believe by faith in your response to the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid it all. He paid, listen to me now. He paid it all. He paid it in full and for all time. Do you know this? Know this. This is the key for your light walk the rest of the way. All the time. Paid in full. Paid it all. And as you see, as you get closer, you'll see another sign. It'll say sanctification now. You say, okay, I'm going this way. He set us apart to do this. This is where he sets apart every believer, holy and daily, in heart and life, by the work of the Spirit, making the believer holy in practice, because we're searching, we're searching out for this holy God. And then finally, the big destination glorification, the complete transformation in the time when we hear the trumpet call to image bearers of Christ. Isn't this what happened in the garden? Mm -hmm. He created man, male and female in his image. Jesus Christ, the fulfillment. You see the gospel in this. You see how it all comes together. It's not all the end. It's not the garden. Okay, I got the sin. No, you see this work of Christ, the fulfillment. This is unbelievable that we can bear this image of God. This is the gospel, the active, redeeming work of God. When the trumpet calls, you get your new body. Maybe I'll be able to walk. Amen. <laughs> so let's let's just summarize this. See, this is the gospel. Because you know what you're going to find people? You're going to find people that might have been hurt so bad. They might have had a tough time. But they're already on this road. Everybody's on this road. Some just stop way, way too soon. Because they're harder than their desire to know for God. But let's just summarize this. The gospel is, it's a divine grace of God's character. It's by grace alone. You see this throughout scripture. Protected people. He called you. It's God's grace alone. The gospel is God's work in and through Christ alone, closing the great chasm of sin and rebellion. <coughs> through Jesus Christ, this is the gospel. The gospel is re a regenerating action of the Holy Spirit that leads to repentance by faith alone. The gospel is. The Bible narrative, that, that funnel from, from the beginning of creation through this New Testament, through these new promises and covenants with Jesus Christ. By Scripture alone, we have this. We've got a trail map, by the way. But it's more than a trail map. It's God's Word to us. And finally, the Gospel is purely given to us by His glory alone. This is the great gospel trail of salvation. So when people, when they ask you, and you want to know about their faith, asking them if they're saved is such a short and maybe even confusing for them. See, because they might have grown up in a religious home. And see, they're stuck by the sign of all these rules. And if i got to follow more rules, and if i got to follow more signs, that's not for me. I couldn't even do it the first time. And they might stop. You need to know where they're at. 
This is what I tell everybody at Bible study every week. Now I want to tell you. You need to be good listeners. You need to know where are they on this trail? See, God might be doing something inside. Where are you in this journey? Maybe your path was filled with rebellion and turbulent times. Maybe it's a church problem, right? That you've been hurt by a church. What is it in your journey? Maybe there was such a great chasm that you felt there was no hope. Maybe you want to give up. Maybe the church isn't for you. Or you feel like it's not for you. Maybe you did try to follow all the rules, be that good middle child. Right? But you couldn't do it. And at the end of it, your, your relationship with God never changed. Maybe you got wider the chasm. Maybe there were some highs in your life. Like you felt like, wow, God was doing something. He was raising something up. Maybe almost like one of those Old Testament kings. He was raising up something inside you that you, for the first time you were standing on this little part of the climb on this mountain. And you could look out and you got this short vision before you really got up high. But you, what you saw was beautiful. But even there, it was short-lived. Maybe he sent people into your life, like a prophet, to speak life, to speak hope, to speak power into your life. And even then, maybe you got discouraged, maybe you got frustrated, maybe it wasn't enough. This is what I tell you. You're searching for the wrong thing. You need to search for God. Amen. Our friends did our God. Me, thank God I'm not God. <laughs> but once we stop, once we stop, we say it's time to turn around. There's no turning back. See, the ones he called, he will complete this work in. The ones that see every one of these signs, despite all the things of life, keep going. This is only a work of God that He can do in you. Our desire needs to be God. Our focus needs to be God. And when He does this inside of you, when He does this work through the Holy Spirit, we pray by faith that you will respond to Him. You're going to take faith that all you can muster. It's not an easy mountain. It's massive. But yet, it is worth the trial. It's worth the walk. So let's pray.